to kind of tie it in a little bit was how important it is to become familiar with other styles and everything else, especially in today's market. I don't know if you're aware, but you know, it's very difficult finding a, uh, a full-time position teaching guitar almost anywhere. Uh, it's one of those instruments that it's really easy to kind of, uh, you know, a lot of colleges and stuff are, are like, yeah, hey, we just, you know, we can have a part-time person doing it and just teach a few lessons and this and that and the other. And so to get a program growing, it's, 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 it's pretty difficult really. And then one of the things I'm noticing is that there are fewer and fewer positions almost for classical guitar. I'm seeing a lot of stuff that, that people want, somebody that can also teach flamenco, can somebody can also teach jazz and teach other styles. And so I'm starting to see that a, a lot in the, in the higher education uh, field as well as uh, electronic music and things like that. So it's really interesting, like the way that things, the, the way that the career is changing uh, I've seen that that kind of take off quite a bit. So I think it's really important to be able to play ensemble music, um, you know, work with singers, work with work with uh, dancers potentially, work in, in you know in, in different genres and stuff. And uh, that's that's essentially kind of what happened with me. I mean, my my degree, my master's degree is in classical guitar. Serious. And uh, I I started uh, with flamenco kind of kind of late. Um, and actually, the funny thing was, is when I started with flamenco, I actually started to, to hopefully make my classical stuff better, you know, so I always use like Asturias as an example, like everybody plays Asturias, you know, and, but I, what I think is really kind of cool is that Asturias, a lot of people don't realize that Asturias is misnamed, you know, because a lot of people look at Asturias and they go, oh, okay, well, it's from the northern part of Spain, and, and uh, so it's, it's not flamenco, but that's actually not accurate. Uh, so like if you look at Asturias, for example, if you look at music from Asturias, have you guys ever listened to music from Asturias? I, I am not super familiar with all the region and how the music is divided or. Okay, so in, in the northern part of Spain, uh, the, the actual most common tradition is Celtic music. So if you listen to, if you listen to uh, music from Asturias, it has a very Celtic uh, bass. In fact, they even have bagpipes. Uh, so it's a very Celtic sort of, of culture. Um, but when you listen to Asturias, it is, it is kind of like a cross-pollination between Graninas and a Bulerias in flamenco, which is a 12-count rhythm. Uh, and so there's a lot of confusion on the, mis, on the misnomer. Like, why is it called Asturias when it's really from the south of Spain? So the north of Spain has nothing, very little to do with the musical aspect of the south of Spain with, with flamenco. And... Um, the reasoning is actually that Albanese wrote or had a contract with his publisher to write several pieces that were um, supposed to be named after different cities, but he died before he finished them all, one of which was supposed to be Asturias. So what the publisher did was they took another piece, which was the prelude, which is also why it's known as Preludio, and then they, they, and it, they um, assigned it to be named for that city, for Asturias. So it didn't happen by Albanese's choice. So it was actually a piece written for in the style of, of flamenco, but was assigned later on by the publisher postmortem to the uh, or posthumously to the uh, to the to the city of Asturias. So that's why there's that 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 thing there. So when I got into flamenco, my whole idea was I was like, I'm gonna I'm gonna really get to get to understand this this rhythm, this compas, and all this stuff, so that hopefully it would make the uh, the classical uh, interpretations of Spanish music a little bit more accurate, a little stronger. And uh, the problem was I ended up falling in love with flamenco. I mean, it's so much fun. And, and you know, playing with other musicians, you know, like one of the things as a classical guitarist, we play a lot of times solo. And so it's a lot of fun when you're playing with other people and especially when you're playing with singers. Singers provide a lot of, of influence with phrasing and all this other stuff. So even in your classical repertoire, I recommend as much as possible playing music with, with singers. It will open up a whole nother world of, of phrasing for you. And I'm sure that uh, Mr. Guthrie and, and your other teachers in your, in your development have all told you to sing your parts, you know, sing, sing your melodies. And, and that's, that's why it's like, it gives you that, that, um, that phrasing, that, that phrasing. So working with singers is extremely important. And when I got into flamenco, the, the, it was confusing at first, you know, and it's because it's like, well, how do you know what chord to play and how do you know what, what to do and how to do it? 
And, and the problem is, is a lot of times when people approach it, I'll never forget the first time I, I heard a flamenco guitarist uh, live that I could speak to was at a, at, a, at a venue here in Houston. And I went up and talked to him afterwards. And this was like right after grad school. And I went up and talked to him and I said, so how do, how do you do this? Like, what are the chords and how do you, how do you, how do you do that? You know, like, how, you know, that's the thing. I mean, I mean, you ever been in that situation? You're, listening to and you're going like, how do they do that? How do they know what to play? And um, I'm sorry, I talk with my hands a lot. And, um, but, uh, you know, his answer to me was really, was really kind of messed up. He said, he said, uh, oh, no classical guitarist could ever learn how to play flamenco. And that was the, that was the response that I got. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, I guess I'll never learn how to do that then. And that's the way I, I felt about it for a long time. And, uh, but then, you know, it's like one of the things happens is, is, is when you're young and you're working, you've got to, you've got to pay the bills and you've got to eat. So I started playing a lot of gigs in restaurants and things like that. And of course, so I started playing like rumba, like rumba flamenca, stuff that was popular, Gypsy Kings and that kind of stuff. And, um, and, you know, I was, I was working in this one restaurant one time and this, this flamenco dancer came up to me and she said, uh, she was, you know, every time I thought you were about to be flamenco, you weren't. And I, <laughs> I was like, I was like, well, I wasn't really trying to be flamenco. I'm just doing rumba music, you know? And she invited me to go to her studio to, uh, to accompany the dancers and uh, to see what that was like. And so I went and the first few times I went, I just sat amongst the dancers and listened and then and the singer, that's where I met Irma, uh, who I'm hoping we'll get here in a, in a little while. Uh, and Irma uh, La Paloma is the singer that I work with. And, and I met her and I heard her sing. And I was like, wow, this is, she's amazing. And um, so I, I sat there and I listened. And, and again, I was asking the, 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 the teacher of that flamenco studio, I said, how do you, how do you accompany and how do you know what to play and how do you know how to do this? Because they tell you it's all improvised. And the answer was, we just listen to her, the singer, and you just pick out the chords that go with it. And I thought that, that can't be right. You know, there's gotta be something, there's gotta be at least a base knowledge to go with. And so I started listening to a bunch of flamenco and analyzing. So one of the great things about having the classical background is using your music theory to sort of analyze what's happening uh, harmonically and uh, diving into it that way. And then of course, nowadays we live in a, in a, in a world where you can find just about anything uh, online. And so I started finding more information about it and the theory of, of flamenco. So I actually uh, have printed up a little sheet for you guys that I can pass out here in the chat here in a second uh, that talks about like the basics of like choosing the chords that go in, in flamenco and to accompany, and to accompany singers. And I, I'd like to go over that with you a little bit and then maybe show you some examples of how guitarists take that accompanying singers. And so you can kind of listen, even, even just listening with a little bit more knowledge will help you dissect what's happening uh, a little bit. So I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna put that in the chat. So if you guys can, if you guys can access the chat and then there's a little PDF, I just put it in there. Let me know if you can, if you can get that, if you can see it, download it and everything. And, um, and we'll kind of talk about it a little bit and then I'll show you some some examples uh, of some of some things with it. I don't, Abraham, did you set it up to where I can share my screen and stuff? I'm not sure. Yes, everything is set up for you. Okay, great. So let me, let me start off with, with that. I'm gonna share the screen with this. So you guys can look along with it and ask questions at any time. You guys can ask questions anytime. And um, I, I really want you to, 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 to get something that you can take from this and then hopefully go, go back and listen to a lot of flamenco and, and get a better understanding of, of what's happening. So I'm gonna share my screen real quick just on this uh, flamenco harmonies thing, just so I can kind of explain a little bit of it. If it gets too theoretical, you know, let me know. I don't wanna bore you either. So <laughs> just kind of give you an idea. But one of the things that I think is really interesting, when you first look at this, at this chart is that like when you study classical music, uh, most of the time, or not most of the time, all the time, when you study scales, for example, when you study a scale, it's always ascending. You know, so if you're doing the Phrygian mode, 
or anything like that. It's always ascending. Sorry, that's okay. Good, she's coming in. So the Phrygian mode is always ascending, and a lot of times people refer to the flamenco scale as the Phrygian scale. It's kind of not accurate. the The most accurate way of of doing it is calling it's called the Greco Dorian mode, and in the Greco Dorian mode. Uh, we break up the scale into what are called two tetrachords. A tetrachord is, is any scale divided in half. And the funny thing is I was talking to um, the theory teacher at the college I used to teach at, and I asked him if he, you know, if he was familiar with tetrachords. And that's not even something that people talk about anymore, but it's more of an ancient uh, uh, thing in some ways. And, um, but anyway, when you look at the tetrachord, you have two tetrachords. And the first tetrachord starting on the E goes down to the B. And then it starts, the second one starts on the A and goes down to the E. The second one is really, really important when it comes to flamenco, okay? In fact, it's so important that if you look on the next line, when we break down the chords, it is known as the Andalusian cadence, okay? And so if I played the chords, because this is one of the things that's really important. If you look at a Phrygian mode, a Phrygian mode goes like, When you hear it, like if we if you played the harmony that, that develops out of a frigid mode, it would be an E minor chord as the as the root chord. But in in flamenco, the Greco Dorian, the first chord is a major chord, so we'd start off with E major. If we went down the scale, and I'm just going to play like regular chords in in you know in, in guitar position. If we went down the scale, the second chord would be D minor, which is I'm sorry, the seventh chord would be the D minor. And then the sixth chord would be the C. What we call the five seven in flamenco is really interesting because, like, if you know if you know classical theory, the five seven is a dominant seven chord. In flamenco, the five seven is a minor seven flat five, so it's a B minor seven flat five. Okay, and then you go to the four chord, which is A minor, then the G. And what's really nice is keep some open strings. So, like in the G chord, I'm just playing the G. B and the rest are open. And then when you go to the F chord, I do the same thing, just the F, C, F, A, and then the rest are open, which is a beautiful sort of uh, flamenco sound. And then finally the E. Okay. And it's that last tetrachord that on the illusion cadence that you hear all the time in flamenco music or Spanish music in general. You hear that a lot in Spanish music. Um, but what's really cool is, is like I said, employing those other chords as well, because then you can start getting the substitutions and all that other stuff. It gets a little bit more complex at that point, but that's basically where it starts. And when you look at what happens in the music, and, I, and if you can, you know, if you have your guitar, try to play these. I'm going to show you a really cool fingering for the D minor chord, which is just fun to do because it'll sound more flamenco, is instead of doing a D minor chord like this, we're going to take the F that's on the top and put it on the bass. And then suddenly you're going to go like, oh, yeah, I'm playing flamenco now. <laughs> it's so it's got that more, more flamenco sound. And then the C. Sorry. Okay, then the C. Then the B minor 7 flat 5. And then the A minor. G. F. E. And that is your basics uh, or your basic uh, overall chord regression. But again, focusing primarily on the on the illusion cadence or the illusion, the second tetra chord, we can build from that the basis of what is happening when you're listening to flamenco music. Okay, so for example, you can almost break down all of flamenco in, when you're dealing with this type of scale, the Greco Dorian mode, as opposed to say alegrias, which are our major keys, which is their typical one, four, and five. Uh, when you're dealing with this type of progression, uh, we have basically three types of chord progressions or three, three things that are happening. And, and when you break it down like this, and it goes like, wow, it's not this giant mystery that cannot be learned or accessed or, or understood even. But the first thing is, is we have what's called the home base. And I've got two examples of the home base. And one home base is basically you play the same chord. So if you notice, I just have an E major chord there. Okay. Now, I'm not having gotten into compas yet or the rhythms that are involved. So I just put it in half notes and stuff so you can see vi visually what's happening. But you have the home base. 
and uh, which stays on the same chord. If you look at the second home bass, you go from the one chord to the two. So it's the E to the F. And I can stay on the chord. And, the, and you do that to stay out of the way for the singer. So in a sense, when, when a singer is getting ready to sing, you do that, the singer knows you're ready to, to just start. You're giving, them, you're giving them space to come in. So you don't want to do a whole lot of stuff. Like when you're, when you're in home base and you're accompanying the singer, you don't want to be like... stuff because then the singer's gonna like ah, ah, you know they can't come in so you you're just giving them the basic foundation of what it is that you're that you're gonna do and that is your that's you're gonna hear that a lot I'm gonna show you some examples of that in fact um yeah I'll, I'll show you some examples of that in just a second I'm gonna go through the rest of them first uh so the second one is called the vuelta and what that means to return okay so what happens is you start on the second one typically then you go to the third scale degree, which would be the G, back to the second, and then end on the first. So in this context of compas, it would sound like this. So that's back in, in, in home base. So you have the vuelta. Then you have the last one, or the second to the last one really is, uh, is we call it rueda. The rueda basically means a wheel. And that is your Andalusian cadence. And it's, and it's called a wheel because it sounds like it's going around. Okay. And if I put that back into the compas. kind of going around so we call that the the rueda the last one i put in there and this will kind of depend on on how comfortable you are with theory but the last one i put in down here is i forgot to put the title on it but it's a modified rueda and basically what that means is i'm a i'm a approaching if you look at the first chord it's an a minor then it goes to a g on the third one then the f and then finally the e and what i do what i'm doing is approaching the the uh, the different scale degrees by their secondary dominance. So if you start with the A minor chord, you go to the D7, then to the G, then the C7, then the F, and then we have to the E. So in context, it would sound like this. finished with the uh, home base again so that's basically the the overall harmonic vocabulary of what is happening when you're listening to flamenco does anybody have any questions on any of that no yes okay no okay good so let's listen to a couple of 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 examples that i have um i have pulled up and um the first one we're going to listen to is a uh, is a, uh, a tangos. Okay, so tangos are interesting. They're they're an eight count rhythm, and I'll kind of explain the the compas of tangos kind of briefly, just so you can kind of hear what's happening rhythmically, and uh, then we can listen for a few of those things as they come up. But a tangos rhythm is an eight count rhythm, and I think what's really important to understand, especially when you're accompanying in an improvised way is that what you're trying to do is, is like I said you stay out of the way of the singer so a lot of times what people don't realize is that when you're playing a tangos you actually don't play the chord on the first beat you play it typically on the second beat so you the singer will sing on the first beat and you, when they when you hear what the singer's doing then you can decide what chord you need and so you have the first beat to decide what it is that you're doing so a tangos rhythm sounds like this it's in in eight or if you want to look at it in four it'll sound like this one Three. 
accents are on the two and four, the four is the strongest beat. So I'm gonna do that one more time. If you don't have a Gopi Lord on your guitar, don't do this because it'll hurt your guitar. But if you do, if you have one, go for it. But you put the tap on beat one. So it's like one, two for the downstroke, one, two, and three, four. That's it. Like, you know, everyone make it looks like it's a lot of stuff going on, but it's just a tap down, two taps in a row, and three, four, one, two, and three, four, one, two, and three, four. And when you start to feel that in the, it just grooves. Okay, so that's your basic rhythm of, of tangos. I have a, uh, the example I brought, I pulled up is of Paco Sapero. How many of you guys have heard of Paco Sapero before? I can't see anybody, so like, um, there you go. I saw you, I can see you now. But if you've never heard of Paco Sapero, you gotta look up Paco Sapero. Um, Paco Sapero is an incredible uh, guitarist and uh, I actually got to meet him when I was in, in Spain uh, last time. And, and uh, he's a much older gentleman now. He's in his 80s, um, but super nice guy, and super nice guy. And uh, he, like he invited us over to his house and we hung out with him and he played for us. And it was, it was just mind blowing. And I talked to him about, uh, and, and Irma, my singer, uh, was with me at the same time. We asked him about these pieces in particular. And I was really surprised to find out that he wrote these. Uh, and so he's a very uh, prolific uh, flamenco composer, but these are great examples of, of accompanying. So let me know, can you guys all see that? Okay, so Marilu, Marilu is, she's an incredible singer and, and uh, watching her is like watching heavy metal. But one of the things I really like is you'll watch how he is following her. So one of the things that he does to begin with, as we listen to this example, is he plays a little bit of your basic chord progression to get her ear accustomed to where they are. Because I mean, first of all, just so you understand, the guitarist has to play in the tonal or the tone, the key that the singer sings in. So a lot of that, sometimes that's determined beforehand. In this case, it's determined beforehand. But in some cases, it's done on the fly. So when you're, when you're, when you listen to a singer, a lot of times in the beginning of a song, you might hear a flamenco singer go, I that's actually just to tell those guitarists what key they're in, what key they sing in. That's why they have the capo. And so they put the capo, they adjust it to where they need to be, and then they and then they go on. In this case, it's been worked out beforehand because they've obviously rehearsed together and they put this song, put this together. But um, so he's laying out the chords. So just to kind of refresh your ear where they where they are. And then you'll notice at the end of his little introduction, she's she pauses, like she doesn't even start. So he's like waiting to see what she's gonna do. And then she starts singing and then he and then he comes in. So it's 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 a beautiful moment actually when you realize that there's a lot of space in flamenco. There's a lot of space in music in general, and, and you play it and accentuate that space when you can. So let's watch a little bit of this and then I'll show you a couple of, a couple of things that are happening uh, based on the chord part chart that we just looked at. So there's your home base. I was just gonna wait for. He does another chord because he's, he's surprising that start. So let me break that down for you real quick because I think it's really cool. So when she starts singing, she's basically singing uh, the rueda. She starts off with the, with the cadencia andaluz, andaluza. So she starts off with that. And then this last little spot that he did or that they did together was a vuelta. You hear it goes da 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 bum bum and they're back to home base. So that's the vuelta where it goes up to the second, the third scale degree back, back down. So let's listen to that again right there. Secondary dominant. 
secondary dominant of the game. So it's a modified Gruel that he starts with. Second. Third. Second. Home. Now he's going to do the home base. Um, second back to one. Okay, so if you if you break that down again, so we start off with the... And then he does the, the vuelta. And then he's in home base. So you see, it's that exactly that we that we what we talked about is what's happening here. I want to let a little bit of this play again. Okay, so what's happening here is called a falsetta. How many of you guys have heard of, heard that term before? Okay, so a falsetta is is the moment where the guitarist gets to uh, improvise a little bit and play melodic melodic content, and so that's what he's doing here. Back to home base. There's your uh, C major, F, B flat, C, back to the A. Secondary dominant, G chord, down to the one, two, three, vuelta, back one. What do you think? That's very interesting to to hear happening as you are explaining it. It's just like, okay, so there is a solution for the structure of this. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's the coolest thing about it is like when you hear it and you see it happening, it's like, wow, okay, so it's not, uh, it, it's not like that guitarist told me and he said, well, I'll never be able to learn how to do this. And it's like, no, you can. It's like, you know, it, you can. The thing I think that's really important to remember is that you have to have, of course, the, you know, like any art form, if you're studying classical or if you're studying anything, you've got to, you know, respect the art form and respect the traditions. But it's really cool to kind of see how all of that stuff comes together. Which, by the way, I, I didn't think about this at first, but I was referring to this in B flat and all this other stuff. The, the, this is a really cool little uh, little side note of everything that we did. I, I gave you the chords in the key of E, or like, or in the in the in that scale, right? The e. In flamenco music, because the a lot of this was done by the gypsies, they didn't know keys, they didn't talk about keys, they didn't say, oh, you know, we're gonna play this in E major, or let's do this in B flat. You know, they didn't do any of that. They had two keys essentially in the old days. One was they called it por arriba. Por arriba means to the top. And so what they did when you're playing with this E frigid bass, the Greco Dorian, that is por arriba. If you did that exact same thing with down to the A, starting on the D minor, four, three, two, one, they called that por medio because you're using half of the guitar. And so, but all the same rules apply. So if you're playing por medio, you'd have the, the home bass. the vuelta which is going up to the two then the three and back to the home base and then the rueda would be the d minor c d flat back to the a modified rueda with secondary dominance So it's like the same thing, but just in different in that different key. 
and then you you adjust the capo to whoever's singing and then you can play those those same chords does that make sense yeah okay cool <laughs> so let's look at another one because i actually wanted to bring up one that uses that exact that ex that explores that exact uh idea so what i did was i pulled up one of one of my favorite uh accompanists which is uh wanna bichuela and wanna bichuela if you've never heard of him before he's an incredible guitarist and uh he is accompanying here uh, a singer named fosforito and one of the cool things about this you'll see that he has the capo on the fifth fret we're doing tango still He's got the capo on the fifth fret, and so he's actually playing tangos por arriba, like in the E tonality, uh, which is, and he actually pulls in some chords from a different palo, which a different genre, which is called solea. So you'll, you'll hear some of that in there as as well. So what I mean by that is like in typical solea, you, you would have, you hear this a lot, you know. for that E or the F, the sec, which is the second, to the C major, back to the F, and then back to the home bass. So you hear that a lot in Solia. He actually pulls some of that into here, but he's playing tangos por arriba, using those chords from like, that are sort of typical in Solia. And then I'll kind of explain this one as we go too. All right, here's your introduction. <laughs> he's doing that he's holding the the home base I, I, the, he's they're a little out of tune i don't know if it's the video or what so i can't really play with them but uh and then he goes into that's your home base in this case and then he goes into the modified rueda So as at the very end is a quick vuelta. So he's closing off with that quick vuelta. Let's listen to that one more time. said he's doing this one for arriba and so i wanted to pull up another one i actually have another video of him singing this exact same tangos with a different guitar uh guitarist and uh and and this guitarist chose to do the por medio so he put the capo way down on the first fret instead of on the fifth fret he does it por medio and fosforito singing it there i think fosforito would 
could normally sing it like when on the fifth fret is a little bit lower when you put it on the you know because you're on a basically when you put it on the first fret you're in b flat so i think that uh with this tonal he wanted it a little higher so you'll hear you'll hear that here <laughs> of sound and, and the, the and the vocalizations and that's why he's sort of he's sort of you know getting comfortable with this tonal with this tone center that's what that's that's what everybody asks like what why do they do that and that's that's why they do that <laughs> Isn't that cool to hear the same letra sung with two different tonalities? And uh, so let's let's just by quick comparison, let's go back to that one here. very specific uh structure as well which if we had time we'd get into that a little bit too but uh that is basically what's happening but you guys hear that that harmonic vocabulary happening throughout okay so quite anybody have any questions on on any of that so far i got i got a question for you jeremy sure uh so it, it seems that you you were saying earlier because flamenco players or at least maybe before i'm not sure about modern flamenco players in Spain are not too familiar with the classical realm or the classical understanding of progressions and, and key centers and everything. Um, I'm not sure how it is for the modern flamenco player, but uh, I guess it would kind of determine that they need to have, I wouldn't say perfect pitch, but I guess it would, would that like be predetermined with the singer beforehand or because it sounds like either can happen. The singer can tonicize with the player and the player can tonicize with the singer. So um, is it is it that way, or do they kind of predetermine outside of doing por arriba, por abajo, or por medio? Well, that's a great question. Uh, what happens nowadays, of course, like you're talking about, there are schools of, of flamenco and everything else, conservatories and everything else. So they do know their theory. Uh, one of the things I think is really fascinating is, is that, you know, like a lot of people talk about Paco de Lucia. One of the things that Paco de Lucia did was, was pulling in a lot of jazz harmonies and stuff into flamenco. So now there's a lot more uh, jazz influence and in, in harmonies in, in flamenco, but this, the basis is still there. And that's one of the things that's really interesting is when you start getting into it, the basis is still there. Um, and and the the mobility of it, like, so when you listen to a Paco, in fact, I'm gonna pull up a Paco uh, Bolarias here in a second, and you'll see that he actually goes to two, he pulls in two different types of chord progressions for a Bolarias, but I'll, I'll show you that in a second. But to more directly answer your question, um, it's all you always adjust to the singer always. And so 
now when you get a com- when you get comfortable work- working with a singer uh like when i work with my singer i already know where she sings most of her most of her things because we've done them so much but when i go to when i work with a different singer i i just i i usually ask them and most of the time the singers know right so like so if i sit down with a singer i've never worked with before and they so they say you know vamos a hacer un tango por medio in la ter- in la tercera traste you know so we'll like we'll do the we'll do the tangos por medio and the third fret and and they just tell you that right off the bat so most singers know where they where they're comfortable singing and they can just tell you that and, makes sense yeah, yeah. And, and uh yeah so that's you know and sometimes they may tell you and in fact my, my i've done this with my singer before as well where maybe she wasn't feeling well one day or she was a little, had a little cold and she'll say you know what we have to drop it uh, a half step you know from where we normally do and and whatever so we we kind of work it that way um but it is it is it's you you know like i said when you work with a singer they kind of know where they do it and of course again as a flamenco guitarist just like um just like if you were a blues guitarist you have to know the chord progressions you know the basic chord progressions and then you have variations within those chord progressions of how a singer would treat it sometimes a singer will hang out longer on a note than they normally do or there are some there are some vocabulary where you'll hear the the chord progressions um you know modified a little bit and i can i can if i can get Irma in here in a second i can show you a little bit of that um but i wanted to show you just real quick how this translates to a solo guitar performance okay because i think it's really cool when you start to see how they're still doing the same things but they get kind of modified a little bit so I pulled up, I don't know if you are familiar with Tomatito. Tomatito is another incredible guitarist. This is a Bolerias, so it's a 12 count rhythm, but you're gonna see the same things. You'll, you'll know like he, with, without a singer, you basically, the guitarist, what they do is they string together a bunch of falsettas, okay? So in the traditional sense, you know, when you accompany a singer, cause really in order to be flamenco, you have to accompany a singer. Like uh, most people that say when you're, uh, uh, um, you know, to be a real flamenco guitarist, you have to be able to accompany the cante. And, um, but all the guys that accompany Kante really well can also play solos really well, right? So this is, this is a great example of that. And so Tomatito is building this Bolerias off of that traditional vocabulary. And you'll hear that when he gets to, he, he establishes the home base to separate the falsetas. And so I'll kind of show you that here. <laughs> back to the one so that's your, he's establishing the home base and after that after that introduction one of the things you're going to notice is he starts getting into this is a little bit more advanced than the than the basic so he's doing some chord substitutions like instead of doing the b flat he's doing the g minor uh and stuff like that g minor seven and b flat are very closely related so he's throwing some of those types of things in there and then secondary dominance and i'll show you i'll show you some of that here these are your secondary dominance this is based on a modified guerrilla Okay, so did you hear that? That whole falsetto was basically a modified rueda, starting on on uh, the the like the the the, mi- the D minor, then doing the G seven, and then the C, and then the F seven, and then the B flat, and then back to the home home base. Let's listen to that one, one more time. There's your F seven. In that home base, he did a vuelta. I don't know if you heard it, but he did the one, the the two, the three, and then back to the one. So let's let's listen to that one more time. Home base. Secondary dominant F seven. So we back up. Vuelta. That's a really clear vuelta right there. He goes from the B flat up to the C, the back to B flat, and then to the A. You can actually see him do it this one. And I'll just watch that. C flat A. So there's your there's a very quick, but that's also a vuelta. 
Now let's watch Paco do one. And I got it kind of paused here, right? Where he's doing almost the same type of chord progression. And then he's gonna close out by going to a bolerias in the key of A minor. So you're doing your typical A minor, D minor, E7. So you can see that he's already getting to that uh, idea of just like completely changing keys, which is kind of cool to see. <laughs> He did secondary dominant, and then he did the a, a quick cadencia on the loose at the end. Let's watch that one more time. That's kind of cool. Right here, he's hanging out on the he's hanging out on the A seven. So he's, he's, that's the root chord, that's your home base, but he's, he's turned it into this dominant seven so that he can use it to, to modify, to modulate to the D minor, to the, like the A minor going to the four chord. Secondary dominance. This was really cool. I'm, I'm gonna point this out to you because you can actually watch him do it. So he's playing this, uh, this A7, right? And then he goes, then he goes to like this secondary dominant type of thing to the, like, like the modified rueda. And then he throws in that B minor seven flat five here instead of the, like what you normally do the B flat. And look at that, that there's only one note difference between the B flat and the B minor seven flat five, right? So he's, it's a very sneaky. And then he takes that to the dominant or the, to the two chord. And now we're now he's playing chord arriba and he takes us takes us to the A minor. So it's a really clever to change to the key of A minor instead of staying here. So like everything's been here. It's, it's a really cool little uh, uh, transition it does there. Let's check that out one more time. But it's still based off of the things that we were talking about before. Right there. That was the guy we we're listening to earlier, and then of course Camarón de la Isla right there. Hey! What do you think? Is that cool to see like how all of that stuff comes together? And like I said, when I just take that back to when I first started learning this stuff, and I and I talked to a guy and I said, "Hey, how do you do this?" And he's like, "Ah." You could never learn how to do this, you know. I'm just like that is so messed up, you know. Like if you want to learn how to do something, study it, and uh, research it, and and uh, you know dive into it a little bit, and do it with an open mind and, and an open heart, and 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 understand that you know you can learn it, and and it's good because when you start to do that, you go like, wow, I can do this and I can do that, and you can see how these composers were doing the same types of types of things. I mean, it's it's a uh, it's a, it's a phenomenal, uh, I think, skill to have in your studies is to explore what these other people are doing. Because you can go back and take some of these exact same things to 
and see that Turina was doing it and Manuel de Falla and uh, Isa Galvenis and all of these guys were all doing these same, uh, these same things. And so it gives you a fuller understanding of where all of these things kind of come from, you know? Questions? Uh, I have a comment that is, it is so fun to see finally what is happening harmonically because you were pointing at it like so clear. And when you have a, a guidance, things make more sense. So now the music sounds so much more organized and it's like, this is actually so fun to hear. Not only, they, they've seen having fun playing, but now that you, you were explaining it step by step, it's like, oh my goodness, this is so fun. And then you can really put the structure together and see what they are doing. Thank you. That, that was very, very, very enlightening. I, I really appreciate that. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I, I wish we'd had time to 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 pull in Irma to 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 show uh, to show some of that improvisation happening. Um, I, we probably don't do it. It's already eight twenty-eight, but uh, but it's a lot of fun when you see all of that stuff come together. And uh, but I, I I encourage you all to look into it. You know, and 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 uh, you know just now that you have, and, and that was the main thing I wanted to do is just to show you because I know that you guys all know music and you know music theory. And when you have that background, now that you have that basic structure, you can go through and listen and hear exactly what they're doing. And it'll, it'll the commonality that's, that's tying all of this stuff together. You've got the compas, which we didn't really get to talk to talk about too much today, but you've got the compas, which is the rhythmic structure. Then you've got the harmonic structure, which of course all is based on the melody of the cante. And so I think to really understand a, a solo piece of music like that that we just heard of Paco de Lucia playing, you understand that Paco started off accompanying Cante. And that's why he's able to do what he does. Not, it, it, you know, it's not just by playing solo pieces. He learned how to do that and to have that phrasing and that, fra and that feeling behind the music because he started off accompanying Cante. Uh, if you've never, if, I don't know if you've ever seen this or not, but there's a great video on, of Paco accompanying his brother when he was, he must've been 15 years old and it's on YouTube. You can't find it by Paco to see his name though. You have to look it up by the name of the group at the time, which was called uh, Los Niños de Ajeciras. And um, I, know, I know we're out of time, but maybe just pull this up because otherwise it may not be easy to find. Let me just show you real fast. It's a trip to watch, but you can just kind of see that he was uh, accompanying from a very young age. There you go. wish you could tread like that when you were 15. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah, was incredible. insane. Anyway, listen, guys, I, I just want to thank all of you very much uh, for being here. And uh, I hope you got something out of it that you can that you can take back with you to your own studies and and, uh, you know, and, and, and dive into it a little bit more. Uh, you know, Abraham and, and Ivan, they all have my uh, contact information if you ever have any questions you know feel free to reach out and uh you know I, I love sharing this stuff because i think it's important i think the more that we we share with other people and the, and, and that's why i said i love what you guys are doing because you're doing exactly that you're sharing with other people this knowledge and information and and it just improves everybody i think along along the way hey jeremy i have a question yeah hey uh pedro <laughs> Um, on uh, how would you suggest my uh, to approach to get into the music side of it as far as getting to tones and stuff? You know, of course, I know I'm familiar with compas and some cante and cajon and whatnot. But uh, what I'm I feel like I'm struggling with is finding a, a, a universal like tango. We'll use tango since this is what we've been doing. Doing. A universal tango um, 
tone where it, you can either change into others, other tones. I guess you have to know music more, I guess, for that or music theory more. It, Since it, I have that background, it's like, look, I'm, I'm, I guess that's why I'm struggling with it. Yeah, see, the thing is, is that there, there are different types of tangos. And, and, and um, uh, so like, uh, in fact, if, if you guys want a, a clear response to this, let me get Ir Irma. So there are different types of, yeah, there are different types of tangos. Okay, so uh, there's the tangos de Granada, and and those are basically a lot of times we refer to those as the ones that are in B flat. So you have these. This is Irma, everybody, and Hola, Irma. Hola. And so you have tangos like this that are your traditional sort of tangos. And then you also have like uh, tangos de Triana, which are in a, like an A minor. This is like a totally different sound. And uh, so we'll show you a little bit of, I'll show you a letter of each one of those. So we'll do a, a, a traditional tangos and then we'll do one uh, tangos de Triana so you can see the difference in the sound. So here's uh, Granada. So we'll do tangos de triana, okay? And you'll hear the same compas, but this is just an A minor, right? Uh, Like you have those two different types of tangos, and if Irma was so wanted to, she could start off singing one and then move to another and move to the other one. Like you can mix them. So like you know, then it would be my job quickly to make that that transition. And so the kind of cool thing about this is like one of the things that I've discovered is is the more you know, of course, music theory, the faster it helps you make these kinds of decisions. You know, because basically like what Paco did is a prime example. If you're playing in in the B flat or the A for medio tonality, and I want to get to the other one, I would do pretty much the same thing Pablo did, you know, go to the minor. just using the secondary nominates as a way of, of transitioning. Um, but it gets to be even cooler than that. Like what you start to realize is that, you know, this whole Phrygian Gregorian mode, you can actually throw that in almost anywhere. So like even on a secondary dominant, like Rueda, if I wanted to go end up on the C, based on on the C phrygian and then going to the B flat and then back to the A. So you can do all kinds of stuff when you start to understand when and where you can you can play with it. You know what I mean? Understand the compas, understand the har harmonies, and you can you can uh, do all kinds of stuff once you get really comfortable with it. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Overkill maybe? Yeah, yeah, no, not really. It's it's you know I understand. Uh, just you got to know the harmonies, of course. Yeah. Uh, I've heard you guys play before uh, when I was in Houston, okay. but uh, I'm trying to pick up more because of you know health situation and whatnot, and so I'm, I'm working more, and I'm playing second guitar to David, but um, I'm only playing second. I'm not playing lead because I'm fearful of doing the transitions from one key to another. 
because I'm familiar with them. Yeah, yeah. And most of the time, most of the time, you don't really do those transitions unless, unless like the singer does it, right? So like I would never change keys on Irma while she was singing because that would like really piss her off, and <laughs> uh, and 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 you start getting hit during the performances, like eh, you know. So that I would never do that. Um, but if she's saying, if she modified uh, to a different key, then I would follow what she's doing, you know? And um, so I think that's really important when you start getting, when you start breaking that down, but it's like, you have to know, there, but there are certain, it's again, there's certain vocabulary, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and so you start realizing you can do all kinds of stuff. So, you know, but you, you have to get comfortable with those letras, the, the lyrics, the, the cante, to know exactly how to follow. So listen to lots of cante. Like I always tell people, if you want to be a good flamenco guitarist, you got to listen to lots of cante. There, uh, and I'll I'll kind of close with this. I, I uh, took a flamenco workshop once with a guy named Richard Marlowe, and I don't know if you know him or not. Uh, incredible flamenco guitarist. You can see videos of him on YouTube as well. And somebody asked him during that workshop. They said he goes, "How do you become a really good flamenco guitarist if you can't work with dancers or singers?" And his answer always cracks me up because he goes, "You don't." <laughs> so I just thought it was. A great thing to like look into like that helps tremendously so it's good that you're working with david you know that that'll help you out tremendously can i say something yeah first of all thank you for listening to us i happy to be here but um i think it's terribly exciting when um you can see um the flamenco accompaniment from different sides i think that it makes for a much more exciting listening when you know a little bit about the dynamics involved and uh, you can appreciate it more musically you can appreciate it more because flamenco is based on improvisation on living the moment but all improvisation has form because really in my definition improvisation is having things in your pocket that you know really well and you know how to execute at the precise time right so once you've worked with a singer or or you've worked with a dancer for a while, you're able to read each other and you're able to pull that, those tools that you have in your pocket and you know how to really bring out at the right time and make that moment alive. Um, you bring them out and you learn to read each other so that you're able to produce that. And so I, co I really commend you for looking at other genres because it's very enriching uh, for every type of music is very enriching to experience um, the dynamics behind all music. So I salute you for taking an interest in flamenco. I think that's uh, super, super important uh, for guitarists and collaborating with any genre or any other person in general, the collaborative experience is something that solo guitarists don't really work work with too much. And I think it needs to be a bigger thing, not only with other guitarists, but with singers, with dancers, with um, painters i did this i did this interesting uh interesting show where i completely improvised uh there were some dancers improvising and there was a painter improvising during a poetry reading of an eclipse that was happening and it was just it was just an insane experience and i mean i didn't know these people but it was just it was just fun to kind of just throw your cards out there and, and see what you can create on the on the on the spot so it's really amazing So, but listen, guys, thank you guys all so much. And, and, and Ivan, you know, thanks for helping put all this together. And, and Abraham, of thank course, you. And, uh, and Marta and, and uh, Hannah and uh, Eliza. Hola, Marta. Thanks for being here. And, and I hope you guys had a good time. And like I said, you know, anytime you want to reach out, let me know. I'm glad to, I'm glad to help any way that I can. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for, for your time and for giving us this very inspirational talk. I really appreciate uh, your time. Thank you so much. Thanks again. Take care. Have Stay a great well, night, everybody. And we'll see you next Monday. See ya. Bye-bye. Take care.